the breath of God. The breath of God. That breath will come upon somebody today. That breath will come upon somebody today. God decided for this teaching because he wants to change somebody's life. Because he wants to touch somebody. For some of you, this is the lesson for you to rise higher in the spirit realm. The breath of God that will rest upon somebody's life after tonight. That whilst I'm speaking, you are experiencing and you are having an encounter of what I'm talking about. Whilst I'm speaking, you are being translated to higher dimensions in the spirit. Whilst I'm speaking, God is transporting you to higher dimensions in the heavens. You know, the Bible says, the spirit entered into me and set me on my feet when he spoke. So it is possible that while I'm speaking, some of you are already being carried by the spirit into realms and dimensions in the heavens. Some of you will not even understand what's happening to you right now. Some of you, all kinds of activations will be going on inside of you. In fact, I beg to say that there are some of you that as I begin the teaching from now to the end, you may not be able to write because you will be experiencing something supernatural happening to you. What a powerful revelation that God will give us tonight. The breath of God in bracket secret to supernatural empowerment. Secret to supernatural empowerment. Job chapter 32 verse 8. It says, but there is a spirit in man and the breath of the almighty gives him understanding. I like to read it in message translation and amplified version for better understanding. There is a spirit in man. But I see I was as I, I see I was wrong. It's God's spirit in a person, the breath of the Almighty that makes wise human insight possible. But there is a vital force of a spirit of intelligence in man, and the breath of the Almighty gives him or gives men understanding so that spirit is the breath of the almighty amplified calls it a vital force the word vital means living it also means essential there are things that are essential for every living thing to exist and to thrive there is a spirit in man there is a spirit in man that spirit is a breath. I wish I have time to talk to you and help you understand the difference between the man of the Old Testament and the man of the New Testament. Okay, I think I should just do that before we go on. Because my job as a man of God, my job according to my calling is to bring you light and insight. So, it's okay for me to do a little explanation there. You see, when God created man, and I will come there. When God created man in the Old Testament, the man that God created was body, had a soul, and had breath in them, not spirit. Genesis 2 verse 7 says, And God breathed into his nostrils, the man that he formed. He breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and man became a living soul. So the breath was what powered the existence of that man. But that man was only soul and body carrying breath. That was why the issue of being born again was not a phenomenon that was discussed in the Old Testament. But in the New Testament, according to the order of Jesus Christ, when Jesus began to talk to Nicodemus in John chapter 3, 
He said, except a man be born again. Of course, you can give birth to a man naturally because that which is born of the flesh is flesh. But that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Now the man of Genesis was not born of the spirit. He was born of the flesh. That's why the Bible called him a living soul. But when Jesus was talking about being born again, he was saying that the spirit of God will come into man and live as a person so that the spiritual dimension of man that was hibernated can be unlocked do you know what it means to a, for a system a laptop to be hibernated huh you know what when you hibernate a system it is not completely off but it's not functional so the spiritual dimension of man in the old testament was hibernated that is the, that's the reason why most of the workings of God in the Old Testament were physical because that was the only way you could convince a man that wasn't spirit. All he had was breath. Huh? Job chapter 33 verse 4 He said, The Spirit of God has made me and the breath of the Almighty gives me life. You see, he's talking about breath. The same way if you go to Ezekiel chapter 37, what happened to the dry bones when they became corpses? It said, son of man prophesied to the wind and called for the breath, for breath, or, or the breath to come on these ones that they will live. It was breath that came upon them, not spirit. Even though that breath was still the spirit of God, but not the spirit of God in his fullness, not the spirit of God as a person. It was when Jesus died that that possibility was unlocked that a man could be born again. How? By the Spirit of God coming to live as a person in a man. So the man in Christ Jesus in the New Testament is now spirit, soul, and body. 1 Thessalonians 5.23 It says, May the God of peace sanctify you wholly and I pray that your spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless this is now the man of the new testament spirit soul and body but the man of the old testament the man of genesis was breath soul and body now job 32 you will understand better when he says that the breath of the almighty gives him understanding so when god breathed into adam it was a part of himself that he gave adam so that that body that was dead can come alive and can interact as an intelligent being it's more like ai when you create a robot and they give it what they call artificial intelligence in other words this is not innate intelligence that cre that creation was not intelligent in itself but you you formulated something you formulated an intelligent system and inseminated into, into, into that creation so that the creation can live and interact as though it was a, a human being but the intelligence it's working with is borrowed they call it ai is that true so job said there's a spirit in man and this spirit is in the form of a breath that this breath gives man understanding it makes man an intelligent being not a robot it makes man a higher classified creation than animals. It gives man an intelligence that is not common to animals. It is possible because of the breath of God. There are four things I will tell us that I want us to note. Number one, God works by his divine patterns in the establishment of things god works by his divine patterns in the establishment of things god works by his divine patterns in the establishment of things john chapter 1 verse 1 to 3 the bible says in the beginning was the word and the word was with god and the word was god 
the same was in the beginning with God. It says, and all things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. That's verse 3. So the reason why God began the beginning with the word was so that the word can become the template for the creation of all things. The word can become the pattern. The word can become the image. In those days, how do they design a signboard? An artist will cut letters with paper, isn't it? And then take paint and then impress those papers on the signboard. And when they remove the paper, you find the exact letters according to the image that was cut out in the paper. That means that you can't correct anything on that signboard again. If you, if you need to change anything, you have to change it at the image form on the paper. So that's what the word was. That everything that will exist in heaven and on earth, God wanted it to be patterned according to the word. God wanted everything to find their being, their existence, the intelligence with which they would thrive. And the order, the kind they will produce, God wanted it to be part and parcel of the world. So, in Genesis chapter 1, 26 to 27, in the creation of man, for instance, huh? man was created according to the image of God. The Bible says, let us make man in our image and according to our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, the birds of the air, over the cattle, over the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. Verse 27, so God made man in his image and after his likeness, male and female created he them. So man was created in the image of God. But in chapter 2 verse 7, the Bible says, God formed man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life so that man became a living soul. Chapter 1, 26 to 27 is what I call the creation of purpose. Chapter 2 verse 7 is what I call the formation of existence. This is, I'm talking about patterns now. Huh? Remember point number 1. That God works by his divine patterns in the establishment of everything that God will establish has a pattern. God is not spontaneous in creation. God is spontaneous in his move, but not spontaneous in creation. God is spontaneous in response, but not spontaneous according to his will. Before time began, everything that will exist, he had already patterned them. He had created a template so that nothing will be by accident. Because if anything was created by accident, then that thing will have the absence of the will of God. And that means God will not find his image on that thing and God will not be able to superimpose the government of his kingdom over that thing. The influence of the government of God's kingdom cannot rest on that thing. That's why God did not allow for spontaneity when he was creating. That's why when two love birds sleep with each other when they are not married and the person gets pregnant they say they mistakenly got pregnant you know that's foolish talk you don't say it's mistakenly when you were doing it nobody told you so just you know to see to somebody amen you are quiet what's the what's the problem are you guilty as charged amen so they may call the action a mistake, but that thing is not a mistake. So, when God created man in chapter 1 of Genesis, the purpose of man was created. That's why he specified it there. Let him have dominion after our likeness. Let him live in our image. That means God is intelligent. God has reasoning. God thinks. It's unfortunate that a lot of believers have thrown away their reason. And because of that, they are victim to so many things that common sense should have helped them avoid. God who created everything you find in your life was created in the image of God. Everything you find in yourself by default when you were born is in God. So if God created reasoning in you, he's not a fool. He too has reasoning. He said, come now, let us So there are times, it's not every time you pray about, no, there are things that God has given you a reason to think.
and then in chapter 2 was the formation of existence this is how man will exist how God breathed into his nostrils a dead body that means that man was formed to exist by depending on God in fact in theology there's something called anthropology anthropology is the study of man is from the word anthropos which means man the word anthropos means man and then logos which means study the study of man the word anthropos there the original meaning is a being that was created to look up did you get that or you are your mind is in the shawarma somewhere the word anthropos which defines the study of man the original meaning is a being created to look up who is up god that means man was created to naturally depend on god that is why you find chaos and trouble when a man decides to live independent from god and that was what adam did in genesis chapter 3 when he ate that fruit what was it was he a big what's the big deal about eating a fruit it was not about the fruit it was that adam distorted the divine pattern and decided to declare independence that was why god chased him out of the garden since you have decided to distort my pattern i created you to always depend on me but since you have decided to do things your own way there is no way you can exist within my environment of provision because it is a man that submits to god's vision that will experience God's provision. The choice is yours. The, the kind of life you want to live. is either you are depending on God. As a child depends on their father. And you know a child doesn't worry about anything. They can ask their parents for anything. They believe in their mind. In their minute reasoning. They believe that their father can provide everything. Fathers praise the Lord. Okay they answered you know why they didn't answer very loud it's the burden of fatherhood amen some of them just bought milk and uh, baby food 20,000 so there's no strength to answer again amen may God bless all the fathers in Jesus name amen. and the upcoming fathers may God prepare you for the race ahead amen, amen. we are shouting amen now when the thing reach In Genesis chapter 1, verse 11 to 12, we find the creation of vegetation on the earth. The Bible says, let the earth bring forth grass, the herb that yields seed, and the fruit tree that yields fruit according to its kind. Whose seed is in itself on the earth, and it was so. And the earth brought forth grass, and the herb that yields seed according to its kind. This is another pattern for vegetation. That everything was going to produce according to its kind. So, God operates with divine patterns. God has his patterns for the establishment of everything. Your destiny has a pattern in God that you must discover by the revelation of the Spirit, following it by the wisdom of God and making predictable outcomes through life. Every assignment that God gives to you has a pattern in which it will be done. In mathematics, they will tell you that you should show walking. You know, I used to crack a joke those days. I said that when we were in primary school, you can do anything and get away with it. As far as you feel the answer, you are good. And many of us were scoring high in mathematics. When you enter secondary school and you wrote Juno White, they started sharing another answer sheet. What's this one for? Show walking. Is that true so God is more interested in the patterns that he uses for the establishment of things number two in creation God's pattern is to create container before infusing it with content in creation God's pattern is to create containers before infusing its content God's pattern is to create containers before infusing its 
content. God does not create content before container. He creates container before content. And God formed man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. A man became a living soul. Container before content. Do you know that that content that was the breath that he breathed into the nostrils of man, that breath captured everything that was written in Genesis chapter 1 verse 26 to 27. Because let's do a little brainstorming. Genesis 1, 26, 27. So God said, and God said, let us make man in our image and after our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and this and this and that and that. Then in verse 27, the Bible says, so God made man. God created man, not make. In his own image, in the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. But you don't find in chapter 1 God addressing this man. The reason is because this man was not a physical creation. That's why I said it was, it, this was the creation of purpose. In fact, the word create in verse 27 is in the same sentence with the word image. Because the word create, when you look at it in the root Hebrew word, it speaks of your imagination. So, it is safe to say that the man that was created in that verse 27 of chapter 1 was created in God's imagination. Just like when you want to fry bones, all the process and the finished works, let me use that word, the finished product is in your mind. You have a picture of what you want to create, isn't it? Unfortunately, sometimes many, many ladies have a good picture in their mind and then they have an abstract. It's not man they created, it's a monster. You want to cook spaghetti and then in your mind, what I ordered versus what I... So everything that happened in chapter 1 verse 26 to 27 happened in God's mind. And God blessed them and said, be fruitful and multiply blah 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 but then you come to chapter 2 and the bible says that God formed man so which man was he talking about in chapter 1 his mind if you don't believe why did God create imaginations in you God created imaginations in you so that you can imagine nations for your destiny because as a man thinketh in his heart When you get to heaven and you don't need to wait for Jesus to come to get to heaven. But when you get to heaven, you will discover that your thoughts are faster than your speech. In the realm of the spirit, your thoughts carry life. That's why Job said in that chapter 32 of verse 8, in amplified translation he said there is a spirit a vital force of intelligence in man vital means living that your intelligence carry life even AI has already AI at least explains it to us that they create devices can I have a phone they create devices now this is a non-living thing according to you isn't it this is a living thing no? because it has intelligence like a living thing you can instruct it there are some of you that have phones that have voice to text you can be talking and it's typing there are some of you that have phones that by looking at it it unlocks the screen isn't it so in the realm of the spirit the technology of the realm of the spirit is that your thoughts are living beings. So the reason why certain people are always depressed is because in their mind, that's the picture they see. So they've given life to a false picture. 
and that's why even though God says that I will extend my peace to her like a river the reason why they are lacking peace is because they have a picture that must be changed there is a living being in their mind that as far as the realm of the spirit is concerned that becomes their definition until there is a change in that picture that's why Paul said that the eyes of your understanding will be enlightened So God creates container before he puts content. God creates a man before he infuses purpose. God creates a territory before he sends an evangelist. God creates a home before he puts in it a house. I know you think a house is this building. But if you read the Bible, most times when the Bible says the house of Jacob, do you think he was talking about a building? When he said the house of Jacob, the house of Israel, the house of Simeon, what is he talking about? Everything that comes out of your loins, your genealogy. So God will create a home. That means that that marriage between you and that lady or between you and that guy was not by accident. Before the both of you were born, before your grandparents existed, in eternity, God had crafted and fashioned that the two of you somehow will meet yourself and this is going to be the home and this is what God will do with this home and then when you come into time two of them are born one is born in the UK the other one is born in Sapele in Delta State and by divine operations two of them will meet in Oxford University and then they say they fall in love not knowing that that love was also part of God's purpose because God will create container before content that's why God looks for a vessel before he pours the anointing because he creates container before if the vessel is not yielded forget about the anointing the tap will remain closed so if you want to see the full import of the power of God at work in your life become a yielded vessel then you will see how much God can flow through a man Are you getting blessed? Number three, be seated, please. In keeping with divine patterns, in keeping with divine patterns, God will only empower what he manufactured. In keeping with divine patterns, comma, then these two sentences, God will only empower what he manufactured. God will only manifest what he created. In keeping with divine patterns, God will only empower what he manufactured. God will only manifest what he created. Philippians 1.6 He that has begun a good work in you is able to perform it, to complete it, until the day of Jesus Christ. God will only empower what he manufactured. God will only manifest what he created. You need to understand the meaning of manifest. To manifest means to give life to something. Please bring reverend to the front. To manifest means to give life to something. Listen here. To manifest means to cause to exist a particular thing. The Bible says God formed man from the dust of the ground and breathe into his nostrils the breath of life and man became man became that is manifestation the reason why man could manifest was because he was created by god it was god that formed man from the dust of the ground so if another spirit was responsible for the formation of that man he wouldn't get the empowerment that comes directly from god are you hearing me so when an idol is crafted in your village those people that crafted the idol they will need to beseech the demon spirit that that idol is meant to adumbrate or represent so that the spirit can now come to give life because in the realm of the spirit it is possible for a being to give his life to give his intelligence to a thing even in the natural we call it a clone you can clone something after you 
So in the realm of the spirit, spirit beings can give life. They can give their intelligence. They can give their being to function in a thing. And that's what you call manifest. So manifestation, as far as God is concerned, is only due to when God has created something. Only when God creates something will he cause it to manifest according to his purpose. So if God has created your purpose, if God has created your destiny, he will cause you to manifest according as he created, not as you want. You know, I was talking with a pastor friend from Germany this week that most times the reason why we pray to God over some things and we don't seem to get answers or God seems to be quiet even when we pray long is because sometimes we want God to answer according to what we want and God will not answer according to what you want God will answer according to his will so anytime you find yourself praying over an issue and God is not talking check what's in your heart it may be that you are trying to push God to say what you want and it's a dangerous place it happened to Balaam God told Balaam, don't go there. Don't follow this man. Balaam refused because he saw money. He left. God now said, okay. God spoke to him again and said, okay, go, but only what I tell you. Now, that, it was not God's will for him to go. So from that point, God was, the reason why God had to, why did I enter here now? The reason why God had to, uh, 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 God had to compromise with Balaam, let me use that word, was because Balaam, as at that time, apart from Moses the only other prophet that had the spiritual stature that Moses had was Balaam and God knew that because of Balaam's understanding of the realm of the spirit there are things that Balaam can legislate from the heavens over the earth that must manifest God knew that Balaam by reason of his interaction both with God and with demons Balaam understood certain laws in the realm of the spirit. This may not be for everybody, but it will be for a few people who are spiritual. Balaam knew certain laws. And you see, the thing about the laws that God has placed in the realm of the spirit is, it doesn't matter who is applying them. It doesn't matter who is obeying them. As long as you obey them completely, they will manifest. There are spirit agencies. There are spirit beings. There are spirit um, 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 technologies assigned to command manifestation to the one who keeps those laws for instance the bible says as long as the earth remains seed time and harvest it doesn't matter whether it's a believer whether it's a muslim whether it's a buddhist whether it's a traditional worshiper seed time and harvest that's why a yahoo boy will give and experience abundance not because god wants to bless him but he understood the law that God has placed. And all of the laws of God, this is not part of my teaching, but this is for somebody. This is a school for somebody. But you see, all the laws that God has placed, he has set power systems to enforce the manifestations of this law. That when you obey it, it will manifest in your favor. So God knew that Balaam had that intelligence. And if God does not do anything to stop Balaam or compromise with Balaam, Balaam could go there and curse them. Because the king told him, he said, For I have heard that him who you curse is cursed, and him who you bless is blessed. That's why God told Balaam, Don't go. But then you have God coming again and say, Go. So be very careful when God has told you no to a thing, and later God says yes. Check what was on your heart. It could be, you have pushed God to say what he doesn't want. And maybe because of your work with him, God has to just compromise at least. I give you another example. God told Moses, speak to the rock and water will come out. What did Moses do? He struck the rock. Did water come out? Yes. You're welcome, sir. And your wife. God bless you. God bless you. Who brought the water out? It was God, isn't it? Ask yourself, so if God knew that Moses did the wrong thing, why did God produce result? It's because of relationship. So don't try to force that lady on God as your wife. Be careful. God does not change. If you understand divine patterns, God does not change his word. Yes, from yesterday is yes today. He said, let your yea be yea and no be no. If God told you yes yesterday, and now God came, and, or if God said no yesterday, 
and today God is saying yes you didn't hear God the Bible says God will give give them up to a reprobate heart so when God has tried to convince people to stop doing something and they refuse he can give them up to their own will so that's why you heard yes today meanwhile God told you no yesterday that yes you heard today is your own will at that point go and seek counsel and you know I made a statement at the beginning of this year that I won't talk twice over an issue if you come to me to pray on an issue and I say this is what I perceive or this is what God is saying don't come back again what do you want so let's go back to our teaching that was for somebody you know everybody here you come with one thing or the other in your heart so God has a way of meeting everybody number three I said in keeping with divine patterns God will only empower what he manufactures God will only manifest what he created Romans 8 verse 15 to 19 It says, For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. The spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children then heirs, and heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, if we indeed suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which will be revealed in us. For the annex expectation of creation eagerly waits for the revealing of sons of God. Look at where we are coming from. That the spirit of God bears witness with our spirits that we are children of God. And so because we are children of God, born of the spirit, our God is concerned about our manifestation. And the world is waiting for the manifestation of the sons of God. So if you want God to empower a thing, make sure he's at the foundation of that thing make sure he's at the beginning make sure he began it don't start it and go to god it's wrong don't start the relationship and then go to your pastor and say this is the girl i want to marry you know what your pastor will do if he's a righteous man he will just bless you people what you will do is when you start liking the girl go to your pastor and say this is the girl i like oh what are you seeing that's the right way and it's not because anybody wants to control you. Who has time for you? I will send pastors after my heart that they will teach you in the way of understanding and knowledge, isn't it? You know, like me, if you start the thing and you bring it to me, in fact, you even engage the person, then you now bring the engagement. Ah, straight to the altar. Just they go like that. Like pilot, I'll wash my hand. There's no time. You see, you... <laughs> oh god you know <laughs> there's not enough time to pray you see there's so much to pray about i can't be carrying another burden on my head let me advise any man of god here please once people start something and they have gone far before coming to talk to you about it eh? save yourself don't be involved just bless them and let them go because if the team fail they will say that you were part of it you want to contest for election you didn't go and seek your man of god first you didn't go and pray to find out if it's god's will and if god will back you you went and bought card in apc and then one month to the primaries that's when you are looking for your man of god ask yourself your other colleagues from the other side that have jasmine and juju men is it not their juju men that will see for them first whether coast don't clear you know of all the spiritual people Christians are the most lazy. I'm sorry to say, just the truth. If Christians were as fervent as idol worshippers or witches, I mean, the sons of God will be manifesting. So you want God to help you empower something, let him start it. It was God that sent Jesus as the savior of Israel. It was God that released him from River Jordan. This is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased took him to the wilderness and when he was done with that test the bible says he returned in the power of the spirit why because all through from the conception till his birth till this time it was the will of god a zone where you are immune to satanic witchcraft attacks 
is when you are in the center of the will of God. If you didn't send yourself and God sent you, I'm telling you, demons will be stranded before you. Take it from me. Number four. So as long as divine patterns are kept, God will release his glory. He will release his empowerment. He will release his spirit to manifest. Number four. Did I say number four? Okay, no need for number four. Now, how does God empower men? By infusing himself into them. How does God empower men? By infusing himself into them. We're about rounding up now. One secret. How does God empower men? Simple. He infuses himself into them. Job 33 verse 4. The Spirit of God has made me. The breath of the Almighty has given me life or gives me life. God empowers men by infusing himself into them. God told Moses, say, I'll take the spirit that is on you and place it on the 70 elders. And the Bible says when God did it, they all began to prophesy. You want to experience divine empowerment? The secret is simple. That God will infuse himself into you. In Genesis 2 verse 7, the Bible says, God breathed into the breast nostrils of man the breath of life. That was divine empowerment for man to function and to exist. The breath of God is the secret to divine empowerment. The breath of God is the secret to supernatural empowerment. You want to walk through this life empowered. You want to walk through this life with the advantage of the spirit realm then you need the breath of God to come upon you. That's why I started by giving you those three points. I said God has a pattern in the establishment of things that he works with. God creates container before putting content. The content we are talking about today is the breath of God. Not just into your body, but into your business. Do you know the breath of God can be infused into your business? The breath of God can be infused into your ministry. The breath of God can be infused into your career. There is a spirit in man. A vital force. Please keep that amplified translation. I believe that's, that's going to be the verse for the whole of the night. There is a spirit, a vital force, an intelligence in man. And the breath of the Almighty gives man understanding. When you receive an infusion of the life of God in you, you have been empowered for success. You have been empowered for progress. You have been empowered to fulfill divine purpose. All that God would need to do to you at this point is to infuse some dimension of himself into you. Anything that God puts himself into, there are benefits you will find in the natural as a sign that God has infused himself in that thing. When the breath of God comes into or upon a thing, there are natural benefits you'll find. There are physical manifestations you'll find. And you know that the breath of God is on this thing. There's something called artificial intelligence that can be put in a non-living thing. How about spiritual intelligence? How about divine intelligence? God can put it in your business. God can put it in your academics and you will excel beyond limits. God can put it in your career and you can rise to high points, high places in few years. Anything around your life that is malfunctioning is malfunctioning because it lacks the breath of God, which is the secret to supernatural empowerment. You may not believe what I'm saying until life has hit you a little bit then you will understand that you have to be spiritual to survive on this earth. Everything on this earth is designed to control its inhabitants. It is not natural to survive and thrive without any issue. No. The world we live in is dysfunctional. Though it belongs to God, but it has been dysfunctioned by the sin of Adam. You know, God said, cost is the ground for your sake. 
And I hear a lot of um, new creation preachers say that that course has been taken away in Jesus Christ. It's a lie. Oh. You don't read your Bible well. It's the course of the law of Moses that was taken in Jesus, not the course of the ground. That's why after the flood, what did God do? A cursed earth. He now blessed Noah. Because blessings are greater than curses. That is why when the blessing of God is on your life, in form of his breath. Because how does God bless people? He speaks to them. And when you speak, what comes out of your mouth? Breath. So, when a man is blessed, I have a series on that. The blessing. The secret to surviving in any economy. It's a series. We are getting there soon. A cost earth. A cost land. They say Meduguri, everything is extreme. They say Meduguri, the poverty ratio is high. They say Meduguri, if you don't have NGO job or you are not a military personnel, there's nothing for you. But bring a man that carries the breath of God on him. Plus, plus, minus is equals to what? Plus. So the breath of God, which is the spirit of life, which is the breath of life, is the secret to divine empowerment. Finally, before we pray, benefits of receiving the breath of God. Benefits of receiving the breath of God in bracket divine empowerment. If you have written it, I'd like you to pray in the spirit for one minute because something is about to open up for somebody. Right there where you are seated, lift your voice and pray in the spirit for one minute. God is about to open somebody's eyes. The benefits that can manifest in your life when the breath of God comes upon you, somebody's eyes are about to be opened. Somebody's destiny is about to change. You are about to see the missing link all these years. You are about to see a secret that has been devoid of you all these years that is about to position you for an advantage. Lord, open my eyes. Shabarate krete ke barakate ske prete ke balazabrana. Breathe, Lord, breathe, breathe, Lord, breathe, breathe upon my life. Breathe, Lord, breathe, breathe, Lord, breathe, breathe upon my life. Breathe, Lord, breathe, breathe, Lord, breathe, breathe. Upon my life, I receive, I manifest your power, your wisdom to the nations. See Jesus lifted up, exalted. I receive. And manifest your power, your wisdom to the nation. To Jesus, lift that up, glorify. of receiving the breath of God. When you understand these five benefits, you will know that all it takes is for God to breathe on you. The next time you go to pray, all you will ask is, Lord, breathe upon me. <laughs> Psalms 104 verse 30. 
verse 29 and verse 30. Psalms 104, verse 29 and verse 30. Please, quickly. When you hide your face, they are troubled and dismayed. No, let's go to New King James. So the book of Job that you'll find, you will have amplified. Say, so you send forth your spirit. Verse 29, please. You hide your face, they are troubled. You take away their breath, they die and return to their dust. Look at the next verse. You send forth your spirit and they are created. And you renew the face of the earth. That means anything that is dead remains dead until the breath of God is added to it. Benefits of receiving the breath of God. Number one, quickly. Wisdom and supernatural intelligence. Wisdom and supernatural intelligence. First John 2 verse 20 and verse 27. It says, but you have an unction for the, from the Holy One. For you know all things. 20. You have an unction. I'd like to explain this verse. You have an unction. You have an anointing from the Holy One. And you know all things. What it means is two things. Number one, it means you know all the things that you should know part time. Then number two, you know the source of all things. It doesn't necessarily mean that you know everything. No, no. Positionally, it's true that you know all things. Positionally in Christ Jesus, in the realm of the spirit, you have the ability, you have the advantage because of the Holy Spirit to know all things. But in reality, what that scripture means is that part time, per season, you know everything you need to know. Why? Because you have an anointing. There's a supernatural force living inside of you that gives you the access to the things that are needed for your growth and for your advantage part time, per season. Number two, it also means that you know the source of all things. So, when something is given to you as a revelation, you can probe the source of that revelation. Because the Holy Spirit is not the only spirit that can bequeath revelation. It is natural for spirit to, to, to cast revelations or visions on humans. Every spirit has revelatory capacity. For instance, I've been preaching to you now for almost, about an hour. Revealing many things to you, isn't it? That's because as a spirit, my spirit has revelatory capacity that is, in, that is ignited and enhanced by the Holy Ghost. Demon spirits also have revelatory capacity. Spirits of hell can reveal. They can cast revelations on native doctors. That's how a native doctor will know that they planted a charm somewhere. So don't get deceived. When a man is operating by a false spirit and he has revelatory capacities, even Satan has it too. But he says you have an anointing from the Holy One and you know the source of things. A vision can come and you can tell that this is from the pit of hell. You can tell that this is from the spirit. You can tell that this is just the opinion of an individual. Verse 27. He said, but the anointing which you have received from the Holy One abides in you. You have to be very fast, please, on the console. And you do not need that anyone teach you. But as the same anointing teaches you concerning all things and is true. You now see why I'm talking about source, isn't it? Because he's talking about you being taught. And it was in this same chapter that, that Paul, John spoke about the Antichrist and false teachers. That anointing abides in you as wisdom and supernatural intelligence. And it teaches you. It can teach you what you need to know part time. It can teach you to probe the source of things. And so that you will not need any human confirmation because you have received it from the anointing that dwells in you. Wisdom and supernatural intelligence. Jesus said in John 16, 13, that when the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truths. The spirit of truth is the life of truth, the force of truth, which is the Holy Spirit. 
He gives you supernatural intelligence. That means that you know things you are not taught. He gives you wisdom. That means you understand divine patterns that produces or prefers solutions to problems. Wisdom and supernatural intelligence. That was what was exhibited in Adam. Genesis chapter 2 verse 19 to 20. The Bible says for Adam there was, no found, there was not found a helper. And in verse 20 the Bible says, or verse 19 yes, that God gathered all the beasts and all the cattle and everything he created, all the animals to Adam. He said to see what he would call them. It's not like God wanted Adam to guess. No. God was so sure of what he had created. There is a spirit in man. There is a breath in man. And that breath gives man understanding. So it was a test run. He brought the animals to man to see what Adam would call them. And the Bible says, whatever Adam called them, that. Verse 19. So whatever the name that Adam gave them, whatever he called each living creation, creature, that was its name. And that means that was his existence. That was his intelligence. So when Adam saw a cat and called it lion, he gave intelligence by that name. He gave purpose by that name. He gave existence. He gave continuity. Everything was captured. In fact, the lion had his sense of being when Adam gave it that name, lion. If Adam had seen a peacock and said, this is my helper that God will give to me, from that day, peacocks would have been the women. And then when God had created women, they would have gone to the animal kingdom. Because the Bible says in the next verse that there was no helper found. That means Adam, by the supernatural intelligence of God in him, looked at all the animals and knew. How did he know it? Was it taught anywhere? No. There is a spirit in man. And the breath of the Almighty gives him understanding. It's beyond your academic qualification. That's why a man may not go to school. But when that breath comes upon him, he can sit eloquent people, intelligent people. He can sit professors and confound them with wisdom. Why? There is a spirit in man. Which school did Jesus go to at the age of 12? That he was teaching the teachers of the law. And I'm not in any way saying that you shouldn't go to school and study. But I'm just saying that when it comes to knowledge, it's in dimensions. There is a dimension of knowledge that you receive when you are not taught. It is called the wisdom of God. It is by that wisdom you can navigate life. It is by that wisdom you can wake up tomorrow and know that there is an accident projected for me. So I'm not going out. It is by that wisdom that Jesus looked at the sickness of Lazarus. He looked at the death of Lazarus say, that, the, that, the, that God will be glorified in him. They say, Master, was this man born blind? Uh, this man is born blind. Did he sin or his father or mother sin? Is he generational cause or is he a sin? Jesus never met the man before, but by this wisdom, he said, no, that the works of God will be worked in him. So somebody can carry an affliction for 30 years. And the only reason for why he or she suffered 30 years is so that a day will come where in the public, you know, face of thousands of people, God can bring healing to that man and glorify his name. Who told you what you are suffering is not going to glorify God in the long run? You say, but my friends, their own is better at least. They had a silver spoon. God, they had a good start in life. They grew up under rich parents. Me, I grew up in a poverty-stricken home. Even my school fees, I hustle to pay. Now I'm in foreign level. How am I going to finish? How am I going to spend money for project? That the works of God will be worked in him. Finish that school first. Then in two years, God gives you a miraculous job. And you shift from penury to being a multi-millionaire. And God presents you to the whole world and says, Look what I can do with a man that came from nothing. He uses the weak things of this world to confound. For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared. You, you, you know, we, we are not able to endure. The Bible says, who for the joy of what was set ahead. Sometimes you need to take your eyes off the process and put it on the goal. The process may not encourage you, but look at the end. What is God going to work out of my affliction? 
Job said that even though my skin is destroyed, yet in my flesh I will see God. And the Bible says, and God restored the latter end of Job. Let me prophesy to somebody before you leave tonight that everything that looks like a disadvantage in your life, may my God turn it around in your favor. May my God turn it around in your favor. In the name of Jesus Christ. Please be seated. God knows how to turn a mess to a message. A trial to a triumph. When his breath comes on it, wisdom, supernatural intelligence. God, you called me into ministry. Why are you calling me to start in Zamfara? Zamfara. There are more, some cities in Nigeria that are more popular than even the name of the state, Zamfara. Is it that you are paying me for my sins or what to suffer? God says, no. Just remain laboring there with those five people. And in your dreams in the night, he will be showing you nations. <laughs> when the season comes and God has found you faithful, all he needs to do is breathe on you. And he will turn the attention of the world to Zamfara. They say, can anything good come out of Nazareth? Philip saw, so yeah, come see. When he came to see the non-entity from Nazareth, the non-entity told him, I, before Philip met you under the tree, I saw you. He said, my Lord and my God. <laughs> Jesus says, he because I told you were under the tree, get ready, this non-entity, you will see even angels ascending and descending. When the breath of God comes on you, it releases wisdom and supernatural intelligence. Number two, divine direction. Isaiah chapter 30 verse 21. It says, you shall hear a voice behind you that will say, this is the way, walk in it. Whenever you turn to the right or whenever you turn to the left. In other words, you will hear precision, you know, direction with precision and accuracy. Wisdom that gives you direction so that you don't go to the right or to the left. The right or left there means that you don't dilly-dally or you keep trying or experimenting things. You will walk circumspectly knowing this is the business to do. You will know this is the house to rent. This is the property to buy. This is the year to start building. Instead of buying a car, build now. Instead of building, buy lands now. Why? You shall hear a voice. Divine direction. So you don't do trial and error. That is never God's will. God never created any man to live by puzzle. Divine direction. Ezekiel 36, 26 to 27. This divine direction comes when the spirit of God, the breath of God is infused in a man. I will give you a new heart and I will put a new spirit within you. I will take the heart of stone out of your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and you will keep my judgments and do them. Divine direction. That breath of the Lord gives you wisdom. The profit of wisdom in is, is in its direction. The Bible says if the axe is not sharp, then much effort will be wasted in cutting the tree. He said, but wisdom is profitable to direct. So sharp the axe and what would have taken you one hour to fell the tree, it will take you five minutes. Let me relate that to somebody's destiny. Instead of God giving you a job now, you start your career and you just keep going. What God wants to do is train and develop you. Develop yourself. You know why? Because, please come sir. If you work hard at your job, you will increase your income. Are you hearing me? Yes. But if you work hard on yourself, you will increase your value, which will increase your worth. So which one is better? Now that job that you want God to give you, he will give you, but it's a job that is from eight to six. And by the time one year is over, you don't know what you did with your life. And because God has weightier matters of destiny ahead, he may keep you away from that job for three years. 
your friends call it delay but ask God why Jesus spent 30 years and nobody knew him and then in three years he shook the world till today ask a question for somebody so God called you as a minister and said, ah, the nations will hear your voice. And after five years, even Mary that you are staying have not heard your voice. Let me tell you something. Every time you find delay that God is responsible for, huh, is a mirage for speed. Every delay that God is responsible for is a mirage. He has just deceived the devil. The devil said, this one is still here after five years. Let's attack other people. He doesn't know that that's the one that will be a terror to his kingdom. And God keeps you there working on you. Teaching you how to, perfecting you on your skills. Understanding the realm of the spirit. Understanding the anointing. You see one vision and you want to jump and tell the whole world. God say, no, keep quiet understand how to navigate the realm of the spirit and then after five years one day you stand before a small group of people and you begin to prophesy with accuracy and precision with distinction as if you have a PhD where did this one come from it was in the cave oh you are a wonderful singer beautiful voice you even have idea for your albums you, you have already written down all your songs three albums you are waiting to go to the studio and for five years God has not allowed you to go to the studio God is saying it's not just about album interact with the realm of the spirit I want to put a sound from eternity in your heart so that through your sound other worshippers will find their sound you are glorious so glorious in your way. Wait. How many of you know when that song was released, there was a revival that came in the body of Christ. There are many of you that are worship leaders, even many music ministers now that God is using mightily. That was the song, or those were the songs that helped them ascend into the realm of the spirit to get their own song. So these ones are stars, but this one is a legend. That's what God wants to make out of you. In your light, we see light. That when somebody is spiritually dry, all he needs to do is play your message. And in the midst of his prayerlessness and in the midst of his weakness, just the plane of your message, will, that person is transported to heaven and he returns back with grace and with strength and with vigor, ready to shake his world just by listening to one message. Because God has infused a sound in you. It's divine direction that does that, that teaches you this. So when God keeps you at the spot, you wait patiently. Number three, creativity. I rush now because I want us to pray. Creativity is one of the benefits of receiving the breath of God. Mm, I wish I had time for this. Genesis 1 verse 2, the Bible says the Spirit of God moved upon the waters. Chapter 2 verse 7, it was the breath of God that he put into man. Job 26 verse 13, he said by your spirit you have adorned, you have fashioned the heavens. So the Spirit of God is the spirit of creativity. Psalms 33 verse 6, he said by the word of the Lord were the heavens made and all the host of them by the breath of his mouth. The Spirit of God is the spirit of creativity. That spirit is what created imaginations in the heart of man. According to Ecclesiastes 3 verse 11, it says he has put eternity in the heart of man. Eternity means infinity. Now your imaginations have an infinite uh, range or perspective. You can imagine things that are even beyond the natural. So what the Spirit of God will do is when the breath of God comes on your mind, it gives you supernatural abilities to be creative. Your mind becomes empowered to create things that are not yet seen. 
For by faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that the things which appear were not made by things which are seen. Those things that are responsible for the things we see are unseen. But when the breath of God comes on your imaginations, you, are, you have access to see the things that are unseen that are responsible for the things that are seen. And then when you bring it into this earth, they call it invention. They call it technology. And it fosters and facilitates human existence and survival. All of these cars they are manufacturing, where do you think they get them from? There has to be a dimension where they are seeing these things. The kind of cars they are creating, I don't understand. I saw a car that they created. Is it Honda or what? It knows how to do. They call it a crab walk. That means all the wheels can turn. You know the way the front wheel turns? The back wheels can turn like that. So the car can stay on one spot and turn 360. They call it crab walk. That's the future. I say, God punish the devil. <laughs> we are still here buying C180, C... 230, you buy C300. Ah, all the girls will follow you. <laughs> Meanwhile, they are talking about cars that. That was a mistake, you know. Creativity. In Exodus 31, verse 1 to 11, and 35, verse 30 to 35, there was such a man that had the breath of God on him, Bezalel by name. Creative. He was the one who fashioned the tabernacle that God showed Moses. How is it possible that you are able to replicate exactly what you did not see? It was Moses that saw the vision. But Bezalel created everything such that the Bible says, when they had finished it, the glory of God inhabited it. Supernatural creativity. Some of you, that's what you need for your business. Stop trying to do what other people are doing. It's laziness. Wait upon God till he breathes on your mind. And moi moi that people eat and throw away, God will use it to elevate you. I heard of a woman who it was selling of moi moi that took her to the White House. Go and browse, a Nigerian woman. Browse it online, you see. Moi moi, moi moi, took her. It's creativity. So it's not about starting the business, it's about the skill by which it is marketed. Creativity. If people like Jeff Bezos and all of these billionaires, Look at the, they, they change the order of things. That somebody without any building or without any company can stay in his house and run a global shopping conglomerate. He's not producing anything, but he's selling things. It's after he became a billionaire, one year later, that he went and built office. Where are Nigerians? Where are Christians? Some of you, God has put in your mind apps that you can develop that will turn your life into a living wonder. Some of you, God has put in your mind the means by which people's life can be easy. But because it looks strange to you, you, you don't know that that's the creativity of God infused in you that God wants you to tap into. You are afraid because you know it will tax you. Creativity. Number four, revival. Revival. Psalms 85 verse 6 Say, will thou not revive us again, O God? Hosea 6 verse 2 After two days he shall revive us and on the third day he shall cause us to live in his sight. When the breath of God comes on you, it brings revival. Revival means restoring life to anything that is dead. In 1 Kings 17 verse 22 a man called Elijah laid on the body of a dead boy and the boy came back to life. A man called Elisha in 2 Kings 13, 21 that had the breath of God on him. Even though he was dead, they threw the corpse of a dead man. He was dead and his, his body decayed. Only bones were remaining. They threw the body of a dead man on his bones and the dead man jacked back to life. So the breath of God was so much on Elisha that even his bones carried residue on it. Revival. When God puts you with his breath upon you in a dead church, that church experienced revival. Listen, let me tell you. Revival does not have to be a program. Just carry, let's find a man that carries the breath of God on him. It will happen anywhere. It can happen on your street. 
it can happen in your office it can happen in the marketplace revival the ability to bring life to enforce the supernatural over the natural he said we thou not revive us again and now in Hosea 6 verse 2 he says after two days he will revive us and on the third day we will live in his sight that was a prophecy about you know in the Old Testament the spirit of God will have to come on dead individuals before they are revived in Ezekiel 37 dead bodies dead bones the breath of God came on them they were revived but in the New Testament you don't need to wait for the breath of God to come on you again you now carry the breath of God inside of you Romans 14 verse 9 said it is Christ who died and rose again and revived King James translation it is Christ who died and rose again both died and rose and revived past tense that means that as a man in Christ Jesus because the breath of God is in you by the Holy Spirit you can live naturally revived the reason why many people's prayer life is going up and down is because they are living with a revelation that belongs to the Old Testament they believe that there is a point where they can get to and they faint meanwhile the Bible says that God gives power to the faint how does, how does he give power to the faint he puts his spirit into a man but in the New Testament you don't need you are not like the Old Testament that the, the Spirit of God will come to revive you you now carry that spirit in you so you can live always on fire for God on your weakest days you are the strongest what did Paul say? Therefore, I would rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ will rest upon me. He said, for when I am weak, then I am strong. I wish somebody got this, this revelation. You live revived. You live charged. There is life bursting forth from you. Your antennas are sharp 247. Gone are those days where you will be hot for two months and then later you just go down. No, your body can be weak, but your spirit that is recreated in Christ Jesus, carrying the breath of God in it, can never be weak. And so strength will no longer need to come from heaven upon you. Strength now comes from within you. Now unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly far above all we ask or think, according to the power that worketh where? Above you? No, within you. To a point where you now become a source of life to people. There are some men of God that if they travel to a territory, all the churches will experience revival. Imagine if we host a crusade here now and, and we bring God's servant, Apostle Joshua Selma. One time I had the privilege of seeing him in his house. When we finished talking and he was to pray for me, he laid his hands on me. He was yawning. He was yawning. As he yawned so much that I didn't hear half of the sentence. But when I left that place, that was when I came back December. We had prophetic school. You saw what happened in prophetic school. Somebody was yawning. You must get there. You must know God to that level. Those kind of men, whether they pray or not, just carry them and land in a the territory. They just stand and say, all oh, the spirits in this territory, you know my voice. Clear. <laughs> what kind of grace did Riyad Bonki carry? One week to the crusade, native doctors are coming out from the bush. All the people that they tied, all the families that they tied, they are carrying it. It is Christ who both died and rose again and revived past tense. You no longer need to live without the fire of God. You now carry the fire of God in you. You are now a walking manifestation of the power and the grace of God. It is you that God will use to electrocute other people into spiritual power. It is your presence that God will use to, to transport men into higher dimensions. There is an energy of God living inside of you. It says, finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. That might is inside of you. There was a man called E.W. Kenyon. Powerful man of God. One of the people who brought the, the perspective of the new creation realities to the body of Christ. It was said that in his church, nobody remained sick. 
Nobody died till he died. If you die, he'll wake you up. If somebody breaks a bone in their body, in the service there, he will go and speak to the bone and the bone will become straight. Go and browse about him. He, he held up E. W. Kenyon. In fact, some of the things he wrote in his book, it took nearly a hundred years for the body of Christ to accept as revelation. We were too far behind. We thought that he was the one who brought the perspective of the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. The positional advantage of the believer. Keep his picture there. It was this man. You need to browse about this kind of people. You need to go and research about their work and enlighten yourself. For years, he was called a heretic because the revelation he brought was too far ahead of his generation. There are men like that in our days. Some of them in the prophetic, they have taken it to another dimension. I don't care whatever any blogger says, but as far as the prophetic is concerned in this Nigeria, I will always respect Apostle Johnson Suleiman. You think if it is fake all these years? No. No. There are other prophets, who, but this one. Another man that I respect so much. You see, I don't care about, I don't, all of this scandal, all this, not my business. Though. Follow people for years. Another man that I salute is you, but Angel. Listen, I'm not his follower, but I respect that man. You have to just believe it. Even if the people around him are fake, even if they are saying, let them say all they want. At least I've followed this man's ministry for over 10 years. It's impossible to fake what he's doing. It's impossible. Look at Nigeria in the AFCON, African Cup of Nations. It was obvious that we'll win it. Somebody came in his service and said, Nigeria will win. No. Everybody that saw Nigeria will win, they saw correctly. But I told God to change it. And he, saw, he, told, he told God, he said, can an eagle carry an elephant? That's what he told God. And God said, okay, I've changed it. And then all of a sudden, many people who prophesied, it looked as if they lied. They didn't lie. Nigeria was meant to win it. See the person that changed it. And if you know this man, listen, you know why I'm saying this today? We are in the body of Christ now. We just castigate and slander people. Let's talk about their good side. Eh, he was involved in this scandal in this country. Forget about it. You, you. If God called you and your life was filled with scandal, how would you feel if people don't want to listen to you simply because of a mistake? How would you feel? This guy has been prophesying on football matches for years. So over time, because he has been faithful in it, he that is faithful in little is faithful in much. God has now increased his authority that now no longer only prophesy on it, but I give you the permission to change it. Argentina was playing finals with which country? France. And God spoke to him. I said, I give you the liberty to bring your date of birth. And his date of birth was 1970 something. That was the year that Argentina won. And while the match was going on, somebody... We have to press into God to carry that kind of power. In fact, you know what? I just preached the fifth point. Power and authority. So no need to go about it again. We need to contend for that kind of power. The reason why they don't respect Christianity again in our territory is because we have too many powerless people. The people that carry small, they are too few. When everybody can carry this thing. I and the children that the Lord has given to me are for signs and wonders. You that is there at the end of the overflow listening to me. You are here because God wants to infuse in you his breath. So that you can become a walking expression of the technology of heaven. How did Jesus turn water to wine? All those disciples that followed Jesus, you think they, you, what do you, what do you think will, what do you think is operating in a man that will abandon everything and follow Jesus? If not that they have seen something supernatural. Not only revival, power and authority. Micah 3 8 says, I am full of power as by the Spirit of God. When the breath of God is upon you, you carry power. Are you ready to pray this night?
Let me tell you this before we pray. Thank God for all the testimonies you hear here. You heard the testimonies today and you hear it every week. But I'm not stopping there. This is just the beginning. This is just the beginning. I will press into God until I become a mobile expression of power. That breath, when it comes upon you, it, it superimposes on your background, it superimposes on your weakness, it superimposes on any disadvantage you have. It translates you all of a sudden. It gives you re results that will force your critics to believe you. At a point when the miracles of Jesus became too much, the Pharisees could not hold it. Even the, there was a time they sent soldiers to go and arrest Jesus. The soldiers went there and they were held spellbound. They were charmed by Jesus' ministry. They came back without Jesus. The Pharisees said, where Jesus now? They say, we have never heard any man speak like that. They say, even you too, you have been charmed. There was a time even the Pharisees could not help, they could not deny that this one was a man of God. Nicodemus said, no man can do these things except God be with you. The only thing they were envious of was that he had gathered crowd. And it is true, when the breath of God is upon you, your life will produce results that will attract enemies. But don't be afraid, for he prepares a table before you in the presence of enemies. It's in the midst of adversity that God lifts men. Rise on your feet, we are going to pray. I'd like you to look for the hand of somebody. Look for somebody that you can pray with. We have just two minutes to pray this prayer. Look for somebody. Hold the hand of somebody that you believe can pray with you. That you believe that carries the energy that you carry. Just one prayer. Oh Lord, let your breath come upon me. Lift your voice and pray in the name of Jesus. Let your breath come upon me. Let your breath come upon me. Let your breath rest upon me. Shaparata kateke bataka sudia. Let the breath of God. Let the breath of life. Let the spirit of life come upon you. Let the breath of God come upon you.
your hands in a minute. Let the Lord breathe upon some people tonight. Listen. When it breathes upon your health, you will live healthy supernaturally. When it breathes upon your business, there can't be losses. When it breathes upon your investments, none can go down. None can be lost. When it breathes upon your marriage, is it, it's heaven on earth. When it breathes upon your soul, it is joy unspeakable. No depression. No discouragement. You become immune to pain and grief. When it breathes upon your mind, you become supernaturally creative. When it breathes upon your ministry, the world will hear your voice. When it breathes upon your ministry, you command supernatural results. Please lift your hands. Yahweh is your name. Just preach your name upon me. 